Yes. Thank you very much for for hosting the conference. And yes, I would also very much like to be in Santa Barbara instead of being here. It's cold, uh, actually, surprisingly. Um, so good. Um, I'm going to pick up. So thank you to the talk by Thomas before, which was, of course, a lot about spins. Um, I'm going to also talk about spins, but in a quite different context. So it will be not very much uh, groups and all that. It will be quite a different approach. So it's sort of really motivated by some discussions I've had with people who work on magnetism and who want to understand um, new materials that they are using for hard drives that have quite different properties from the ones that they've been seeing in the past. And they're trying to um, explain them and they don't have the tools. And so we as quantum physicists, uh, at least I as a quantum physicist, and I think many in the audience, I think we have the tools to help them. And we have to see where we can we can use them. Um, so the question um, that that we I want to solve here is um, the following. Uh, so in magnetism, there's something called the allergy equation that has been used by that community for the last 50 years, um, really to model everything in magnetic materials. Um, but with the new materials they are now needing for hard drives, they're hitting limits for some materials at short times. And they're trying to extend their LAG equation in all sorts of directions, but they don't have the sort of understanding of some of the aspects. Of course, they have understanding of other aspects. Um, and, and so often they do something that isn't actually maintaining the fluctuation dissipation relation, which is a little bit odd. Um, so our question was simply, can we systematically go beyond the phenomenal logical LAG equation? And in particular, can we derive that allergy equation as a special case of a general three-dimensional open system Hamiltonian? And then can we use our open system model and suitable coupling function to explore the dynamics beyond the allergy equation? And of course, the answer is yes. So let me first, for those of you who don't know what the allergy equation is, flag it like up. So this is it. It describes uh, a spin's precession in a magnetic field. And, and obviously, if there was no environment, it would just simply continue precessing. Um, we, there's also, of course, uh, in a magnetic material, we have many spins, but today I will not talk about the neighboring spins actually at all. I will be more interested in the, these two parts. So these two parts is the Gilbert damping, a phenomenological damping term, and the stochastic field. So these are usually plugged in by hand, and then people solve the dynamics um, of many spins interacting with these ingredients. But in, in the recent past, as I explained, uh, papers are now coming out where they have to include further terms to that term that I just showed you, because otherwise the dynamics wouldn't fit anymore. So the experiments require this, and they simply add those things in by hand by additional, including additional parameters. So we want to take a different approach that is very much rooted in, in sort of open quantum systems and familiar to many of you. Um, so we are going to construct a system bar Hamiltonian, and that one will look like this. So here we have a system Hamiltonian that describes spins interacting with each other and also an external field. We have here a bath Hamiltonian of harmonic oscillators, uh, one actually for each spin in this case. And here I'm putting in a linear interaction between a spin and a, and a, and a bath X operators. And um, so this is sort of the simplest model one can come up with, really, to describe the, the, the damping of spins in, in, in this magnet. And it's very nice because one can then take the equations of motion, of course, for the spins and also for the oscillators in the bath. And what one gets when one puts this all together is this equation. So this is the Heisenberg picture of the spin operators, so it's obviously quantum. And then um, we have S cross B, the usual, and then we have these additional two terms that nicely now capture the bath's impact onto the spin dynamic. So that's exactly the part that is usually plugged in by hand. And here we have it, um, just like in the caldera legged model, but this time for spins. So obviously these two terms arise because of coupling, the original coupling between our spins and our and our oscill oscillator positions. And so obviously they're going to fulfill the fluctuation dissipation relation by construction. And obviously they're going to do that for any coupling function. So here's the fluctuation dissipation relation in the uh, quantum case. And then there's also the classical limit of it will be important. So that would be the high temperature limit of these cotangents. I'll discuss that in a minute. So this is always going to be true. And that's important for the magnetism community because they don't always get that right. 
So from our point of view, this is going to be true for any coupling function that we can choose in the beginning. So now it starts to be a question of what coupling function should choose. So let's go with, um, so the coupling function of course goes here and it's a function that tells us how much does the spin couple to a bath mode at frequency omega. And so um, here's the first choice. The first choice is a linear coupling function. Here's C uh, omega and ignore this and it's simply proportional to omega. And here's a picture of it. So this pink line shows us the coupling function uh, over the frequency. Um, and I've put it into the scales of the Bohr uh, Bo Lamo frequency. The Lamo frequency is the one in the external field. This is the dominant frequency. And so that's this yellow region here is around that frequency. So in this range, we have a, a linear, in fact, always linear uh, coupling function. here. Um, good. So the kernel that corresponds to this coupling function is a no memory kernel, right? This derivative of the delta function. I believe you all know all of this. Um, so the point of choosing this linear coupling function is that when we plug that in to our general spin dynamics equation, this of course simplifies a lot. Uh, this kernel here that takes into account the memory now simplifies to just simply give this term, this derivative of S with respect to T and, and uh, in front of it is this Gilbert damping parameter. So in other words, I've just shown you how to derive the LLG equation that's been used for the last 50 years from a quantum system buff Hamiltonian with a linear coupling function, linear and frequency, and then you get it as one of your results. So this makes the connection, but of course, the great thing is we can, we are going to be able to go further than this, obviously, um, because we want to go beyond the LLG regime. Before I do that, let me just tell you that uh, what pe people in magnetism currently do is they simulate the dynamics of many millions of spins that interact with each other, classical spins, and that's called atomistic simulations. And what they do is they assume LLG coupling. So they assume the LLG equation, and they also assume the high temperature limit. So they assume instead of this uh, power spectrum that belongs to this coupling function, they assume the high temperature limit where this uh, cotangent simplifies and actually becomes frequency independent. So that will be this uh, pink line here. That's what people do. And as I said, many of the simulations do not fit anymore to the experimental results. So the question is, what is wrong? And there are many things that could be wrong, right? So there's, uh, it could be that it's uh, classical simulations and they should be quantum. It could be that it shouldn't be LLG coupling. And that's what we're going to discuss next. So what happens if we take into account a different coupling? So let's look at a Lorentzian coupling. So here I've plotted... Uh, well, this is the plot. This is a plot for the Lorentzian coupling function of this form with three parameters that allow us to toggle different types of couplings. So alpha is the strength. Omega zero gives us a peak. So we're here assuming that uh, there's a sort of peak frequency at which our spin couples to the environment the strongest. And after that, it decays again, which is physically intuitive. And then there's also a width gamma, which tells us how, how broad is that peak. And as you can see, this is not linear. So when this uh, red curve is, is actually sort of peaked in the region of the LAMO frequency, we have a really truly Lorentzian coupling function. Um, and, and we will see memory effects. So here's the kernel that corresponds to this function. And we have no memory effects that will play a role in the dynamics. And likewise, we will have a power spectrum that belongs to this C. And here it is. So the main point is to see that it has a peak in the relevant frequency range. And that compares uh, very different, you know, it's quite different from what the standard LLG equation would assume. Standard LLG equation with classical noise would be here. And with quantum noise at 200 Kelvin is also there. But if you go to slower, smaller temperature, then there's a difference between the two. But you see that this Lorentzian peak is, is, is even different, even, even then. Okay, now the point of taking such a Lorentzian is on the one hand side, it's uh, physically nice to have something peaked. Secondly, it's very nice to solve a lot of things because you can analytically solve many of the integrals you need. And the and thirdly, it gives us three parameters with which we can toggle between the LAG regime and, and the non-LAG regime. So in particular, we can recover the LAG expressions if we take an omega zero, the peak, 
being very far outside this relevant regime of frequencies. Um, so it looks then like this. So this is an actual Lorentzian coupling function in the relevant range, there is a peak. And this one is also a Lorentzian, the blue one, but the relevant the, the peak frequency is well outside the, the relevant range. And therefore you can approximate it very well with the LLG equation. And so when your material, the specific material you're interested in has a peak frequency over here, you can work with the LLG equation and that will be fine. If your material has a peak fre frequency here that couples to the spins, then your LLG equation will not be fine. So it will depend on the material what you're going to get in terms of the dynamics. And we think this is going to make quite a difference to the simulations they will run in uh. the future. So here's some, ah, um, maybe I skipped that. So here's some uh, short time dynamics pictures. They're very simple pictures. Um, well, actually in terms of complexity, they're a little bit complex, but what they show is simple. <laughs> they show the short time dynamics of a single classical spin vector, okay? Just a single spin vector. Uh, no exchange, nothing, and we can plot this with different kernels now. So integrating the dynamics with different uh, dy dynamical equations. So in particular, we can take the standard LLG equation with classical noise or the standard LLG equation with quantum noise or uh, the Lorentzian, wait, this one here, the blue one is the Lo uh, Lorentzian set, uh, but the uh, Lorentzian set is meant to be close to the LLG set. And indeed we see that all these curves are uh, very similar to each other. So that's just a sanity check that our logic is working. Now, what you can see here is uh, the red curve here is, uh, I should say, all of this is the SZ component, apart from the green curve, that's the X component. Um, so this red curve here is when you switch on a the different Lorentzian with a peak in the relevant range. range. And as you can now see, there's a real difference in the dynamics. Um, so it starts immediately and uh, at short times, and it will also influence everything else. So memory effects clearly make a difference very quickly. Um, and that was uh, what I showed you here was for a large spin. So often, of course, in magnetism, they take many spins and consider them as a single spin of a larger uh, dimension. Um, and that was this picture. But if we really go to the atomistic level of individual spins, one half spin, one half, then here's the picture. Of course, it all wobbles a bit more, but I've also taken it at, low, at a lower temperature. Again, you see a difference in um, in the blue curve, which is like an LAG curve and the red curve, which is not like the LAG curve. Um, so you see real differences in, in the memory, obviously. Um, right. Um, right, I'll skip that too. The main point I want to make is that the Lorentzian couplings really allow us to systematically study how memory and, uh, and how the memory kernel affects the short and long time dynamics, and that obviously always with guaranteed fluctuation dissipation relation. Let's have a look at uh, equilibration curves. So here is, um, this is a curve in time, but this time we have an ensemble average over many such individual spins and um, uh, processing in time uh, being done by the environment with different dynamical equations. So we again have the classical LLG equation, and we also have our Lorentzian kernel with quantum, with a quantum bath, full quantum statistics, and the Lorentzian kernel with a full quantum bath that has memory uh, here. And so what you can see is that whenever you have something LLG-like, this is the this is the equilibration curve. Okay. But if you have something with memory, you get to the to roughly to the same equilibrium state much faster by a by a factor of three or a third of the time. And if any of you know how this works, please can you tell me at the end of this talk, why this is so, because I don't know why this is so. It, I just simply know it's a, a simple argument that I know, and that is simply that, um, sorry, yeah. uh, the power spectrum, of course, um, that acts on the blue curve, for example, is broad, is over here, there's a lot of noise. And the uh, power spectrum of this red curve is very concentrated, so in other words, there's much less um, kicking and, uh, and twisting on our ensemble, so it can equilibrate faster. Um, this is my simple explanation. If someone can formulate this in very nice mathematical terms, I'd be happy to hear that. So let me go forward. 
So we see this much quicker equilibration. It's very important for magnetism people because they want to write a bit of information really quickly in a magnetic hard drive. They want to have quick uh, time of equilibration afterwards. Okay, um, now this is my small spin. And here I'm discussing the difference between applying classical noise, so the one, the high temperature limit noise, or quantum noise, so the full cotangents. And uh, what you see here is that the classical noise with the standard LAG equation gives you this value uh, of the magnetization at one Kelvin. Um, but if you include in your dynamics quantum noise, then obviously even at zero temperature, it's still wiggling, right? You still have quantum fluctuations and they make your spin uh, decay stronger. Even at lower temperature, you have already a lower magnetization value here. And that's true for all the different um, uh, Lorentzians. Uh, so the quantum noise really dominates at these low temperatures. And that's also an effect that we believe is actually affecting the experiment. Um, but to what degree we will see. Okay, uh, here I'm showing the magnetization as a function of temperature. So this is the super standard curve that you learn in school. This is your uh, Boltzmann distribution for a classical spin and you take the average and then you get this curve, which are the black dots. And very nicely, our dynamics that we solved all lie on top of it for all the different choices. So different coupling functions, different bath, uh, classical or quantum. So that's again, this energy check. Now what we get for a small spin, where we look at a, a smaller temperature range, um, then we get deviations. So when we go towards small temperatures, these uh, curves here are the ones that are integrated with quantum noise. And as I already explained, quantum noise, of course, means that even at low temperature, there is still fluctuations on. So our spin will not um, actually equilibrate to, to one. I mean, it will not fully align because we still have quantum fluctuations that, that kick our spin. And so we get this much lower magnetization. And we think that there's, uh, there's some truth in this um, to, to compare this to experiments. I cannot be more detailed at this point, um, but this is a very promising that we can see some differences here that arise from the quantum uh, um, effects from above. Okay, um, I think I come to the conclusions and open questions. I hope I'm roughly in time. So let's see. So the conclusions where uh, we have, based on a system bath Hamiltonian, we have derived a three-dimensional versatile spin dynamics equation, which is this one. So this is very much in logic, like the cadera legged model and the spin boson model. I think one of the interesting differences is that it's three-dimensional and you really get this cross product, which generates dynamics that is not captured uh, in, your, in your standard spin boson model in this way. So you don't have a cross product there. Um, so you recover the spin boson model, in fact, if you take, remember at the beginning, I had this coupling function, but actually the coupling function is a tensor because I'm coupling a three-dimensional spin to a three-dimensional position operator. So we can choose our coupling tensor in different ways. And what I've done so far is to take an identity matrix. So each dimension couples in the same way. The spin boson model is recovered if you just take one element in here or just one row or column or something. Um, so it makes it lower dimensional, but obviously you can study a lot of different uh, situations or so three dimensional isotropic or non isotropic and all sorts of things, depending on the coupling tensor's shape. So in that sense, it's versatile. Um, I think it is not going to be useful just for magnetism, but also for other rotational Brownian motion. So I'm thinking of, for example, experiments where you have uh, in light levitated nano rods that you can play around with here. You can twist and turn them in, in different ways. They undergo Brownian motion and uh, they will also be described by some type of cross product structure and any memory that the bath in, 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 in impacts onto the dynamics will also be described by such a kernel and so on. So I think there will be other applications outside of magnetism for this equation. But within the magnetism benchmark, um, what we've tried to do is um, to match it against what current micromagnetic and atomistic simulations do. And they standardly assume classical spin vectors, LLG coupling with no memory, and classical white noise. 
So, so far we've taken the two steps of including the memory effects, and we've seen that this makes a difference to the equilibration time, quite significant difference. And we've also included quantum noise in the bath, and we've seen that this reduces the steady state magnetization. Obviously, the next thing is to take quantum spin vectors, and we are doing that, of course, as well. This is numerically um, yeah, interesting to solve that, but it can be done. So comparing the differences uh, of a three-dimensional quantum vector that uh, obeys all of these things with a, with a classical version would be interesting. The reason why I focused on classical spin vectors is because currently the atomistic simulations only do classical spin vectors, but millions of them. So if we can first tell them where you should be including some memory effects and you should be including some quantum effects, that's a step that they can easily take. If they need to go for full quantum simulation, that's a completely different animal. So we will have to see what is a reasonable step forwards in this direction. Um, there are many open questions. Um, so the prediction of the time scale of equilibration, as I said, I have no clue. Uh, the steady state, we have a clue. We know what to do here. This will go in the direction of the mean force Hamiltonian and, um, and uh, strong coupling some dynamics. Um, I'm also talking with people who actually do these atomistic simulations. They are, they are now starting to implement our equation instead of the LAG equation to see what the difference is. And it's very interesting to see that. As I said, there will be a discussion in the future about the difference between when you integrate with quantum spins or with classical spins. What we've not touched on at all yet is that, of course, I've assumed that all my bath modes are at the same temperature. Obviously, you can also take your bath modes at different temperatures. That's realistic in a magnetic material because they actually interact with electrons and phonons. And they can be at different uh, temperatures. The electrons, the phonons, and even different phononic modes can have different temperatures. So once you start doing that, you will be able to talk a lot about all sorts of transport of heat and, and so on. And that's, yeah, very interesting and relevant. Uh, I've briefly mentioned that you can also discuss non-isotropic coupling tensors. So this coupling tensor here can, can go from 3D to 1D to everything in between. And this may be very relevant for thin magnetic layers. So if you have just a small thin layer, it will be more like a two-dimensional material, and then this will be relevant. And then in the end, what I really want to do is to bring all of this, what I've just discussed together with this strong coupling some dynamics framework, because I believe it is exactly the tool that, that will explain uh, many of the, give us many analytical um, uh, predictions for what we find numerically. Uh, with this, I end. So these are the people who, who, who did the work. So Connor is a PhD student, Simon is also at Exeter, and these people are working with me at the moment um, on all sorts of extensions to this. Uh, these are the two atomistic modelists who I work with, and I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, well, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, Okay, maybe I'll ask again and let people think a bit more. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious. So in, in classical models, in principle, one can do like kind of first principle simulations, right? So you can take your bath to be the set of some other spins or some cadaver legged and don't do any approximation, just solve Hamiltonian dynamics. As you said, like one can solve like an many equation. I just wonder if... You tried to do this. Direct. This is what we did. Yes, this is what. We oh, did. So you, yes. I mean, John Markovian, you were not really. Yes. I see. So you did like direct. I see. I missed it. I saw. It's full. It's fully non-Markovian. The whole every everything. So there's no approximation here. So you were not trying to derive any kernels or whatever. You just really did simulations. I see. Mm -hmm. The, the kernel, oh, you mean, oh, I, I understand yeah, right, now. Right. You mean from sort of microscopic principles of this interacts with this and so on, you build your kernel together or your coupling yes. function together and then you go the next step. No, we did abbreviate this. We simply postulated a kernel, uh, a coupling function initially, right? So we postulate, mm -hmm. for example, this Lorentzian uh, coupling function that um, allows us to model a peaked um, coupling strength. And, and then the point is that you, I mean, yeah, of course there's a lot of value into doing it microscopically, but on the other hand, you have millions of parameters to choose, right? And oh, in, yeah. the end, in the end, all you want is to know how your bath couples. And so if we can start at this point and say, well, my bath is coupling with this Lorentzian, or I can choose different things, which I can 
separately discuss what is the risk of the assumption. Um, but once I have a Lorentzian approximation of the Lorentzian, I can fully solve it numerically with all the memory, all everything. It's it's all good. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Thank you. So, any any more questions? Uh, we still have time for a couple more. Uh, okay. Well, if if there are no questions, let's uh, send Janet again. Uh, Thank you. And and